hi there. If you've been following the news, then it's likely that you know that we recently, and for the first time, created a living, breathing, dire wolf. A species of wolf-like canid that went extinct around 10,000 years ago, likely from a combination of climate change, loss of prey species, and competition with other species, including humans. So they're back! Though, if you've read past the initial headlines, you probably know that this is not exactly true. But these are probably the most dire wolf-like animals to be born in the last 10,000 years. So now seems like a good opportunity to talk about the dire wolf. What it is, what these are, how they were made, and what this could mean for the future, if you're into that kind of thing. So let's start with the dire wolf. Dire wolves were wolf-like canids that lived in North and South America from about 125,000 years ago until about 10,000 years ago when they went extinct. There are two known subspecies of dire wolves, Enoceon dirus gildei and Enoceon dirus dirus. They were about the same size as the largest modern gray wolves, with the larger subspecies, Dirus dirus, averaging about 68 kilos, around 150 pounds, and the smaller subspecies coming in about 8 kilos, around 18 pounds lighter than that. That said, they weren't proportioned like wolves. And they weren't wolves, so that isn't so shocking. They had smaller feet than modern wolves, but bigger heads, larger canines, and stronger jaws. Based on isotope analysis of many dire wolves that were entrapped in the La Brea tar pits, it appears that they fed heavily on horses, but also on camels, bison, ground sloths, and pronghorns, and occasionally on larger animals such as mammoths and mastodons. To what degree they were hunting these large animals versus scavenging them is still unclear. What is pretty darn clear is that they could bite really hard. In fact, for their size, they had the greatest bite force of any known eutherian mammal, ever. What is also clear is that they weren't wolves. Not those, actual dire wolves. They weren't wolves. The wolves were among their closest relatives. Gray wolves, however, are more closely related to coyotes, doles, jackals, and of course domestic dogs than they are to dire wolves. Not all foxes are foxes, and not all wolves are wolves. Dire wolves are much more closely related to actual wolves than are some other things called wolves. But we'll talk more about that when we discuss all of the canids later this year, as well as the species of canid that doesn't have bones. So be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that. With all this recent excitement around dire wolves, it's so easy to get wrapped up in all of the thrilling headlines. Some outlets run with drama, while others lean hard into sensationalism, leaving little room for the actual science. It can be hard to know what sources to trust, and one headline rarely tells the whole story. That's why I love Ground News. Whether you use the website or app, Ground News helps you compare how different news outlets cover the same story side by side. You'll see where the sources lean politically, and how reliable they are, and even who owns them. Take this recent Dire Wolves story. Ground News shows that over 500 outlets have covered it. Some frame the Dire Wolf revival with skepticism, emphasizing the sort of nature of the achievement and using genetically engineered in headlines. Others focused on the thrilling new era of scientific wonder, drawing Jurassic Park comparisons and touting the company as a $10 billion venture. It's really the same event, told through very different lenses. The blind spot feed is a really awesome feature that helps you escape the echo chamber. It highlights underreported stories so you don't miss what's happening around you. So if you want to see the world through a more informed lens, go to ground.news slash Clint or use the link in the description for 40% off the Vantage plan. That's ground.news slash Clint for 40% off. Thank you to our friends at Ground News for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. So that is the dire wolf. But what are these? Well, these are Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi, three puppies produced by Colossal Biosciences in late 2024 and early 2025 that were purported to be dire wolves. But they aren't. They are, however, quite rad. So let me explain what they are. And to do so, I'll explain how they made them. 
because it is super cool and very promising. If you want to see a dire wolf, a mammoth, a thylacine, a dodo, moa, elephant, bird, or any other extinct animal come back from the dead in the near future. Okay, so I've been seeing some sources saying that these are dire wolves, and others saying that they aren't dire wolves at all because no dire wolf DNA was used in their creation. And I would say that neither of these positions are correct. It is somewhere in the middle. But let me ask you this. If I took a sample of your DNA and sequenced it so I knew the entire sequence, then took the DNA of a banana and edited the banana DNA sequence until it was identical to your DNA, then removed the DNA from a bonobo egg and replaced it with the sequence of DNA that I created that is identical to yours, and implanted that egg into the uterus of a bonobo that served as a surrogate mother, would the baby that would subsequently be born be a human? a bonobo, or a banana. Personally, of the three, the one that I would say for sure that it isn't would be a banana. Yes, we got the nucleotides from a banana, but it's the sequence of those nucleotides, not their origin, that actually matters in my opinion. And given that its nuclear genome is identical to yours, and assuming that you are a human, I would say that for all intents and purposes, it's a human. So I do think this would be a viable way to clone a human. And if you had knowledge about the complete mitochondrial genome, you could take it even further. You may end up with some maternal effects with regard to gene expression as a result of having a bonobo surrogate, but this is no banana, so don't try to eat it. And I say all of this because these uh, dire wolves have no dire wolf nucleotides in them. But if the nucleotide sequence is identical to that of a dire wolf, then I, for one, will have no problem calling them dire wolves. Heck, in the future, we might be able to essentially 3D print complete DNA sequences in the lab, and I would have no problem calling organisms produced in such a way to be the same species as were the organisms from which the sequences were modeled. In this case, Colossal Biosciences examined the DNA contained in a dire wolf tooth and ear bone. They looked for DNA in 46 total samples, but only those two generated usable DNA. They then compared those sequences to the DNA of a gray wolf. The truth is that gray wolves and dire wolves are not the same, but they are also not very different. The vast majority of the genome is conserved between both of them. So if you start with the complete genome of a gray wolf and then alter everything that is different about that gray wolf from a dire wolf to be identical to what we find in a dire wolf, then you no longer have a strand of gray wolf DNA. What you have is a complete strand of dire wolf DNA. So the only question in my mind is to what degree did they do this? And the truth is that Colossal has not yet published a paper on exactly what they did, so some of the details are a bit fuzzy. But we know that it was nowhere near the entire genome. That said, they identified 20 key differences between the DNA of the gray wolf and that of the dire wolf. And then, using a gene editing technology that we need to discuss in greater detail soon, called CRISPR-Cas9, they were able to alter those segments in the DNA of the endothelial progenitor cells, EPCs, that were collected from a living gray wolf. Those altered EPCs were then inserted into the egg of a domestic dog, which is also more closely related to a gray wolf than our dire wolves. And those eggs were then implanted into surrogate dogs and allowed to develop. And a couple of months later, the pups were born. And this is what they look like. And they're still growing. So what are they? Well, like I said before, they aren't dire wolves. While they aren't pure gray wolves either, their genome is, at this point, much more similar to that of a gray wolf than it is to the genome of a dire wolf. That said, this is the closest thing that we have seen to a dire wolf in the last 10,000 years. They are more genetically and phenotypically similar to dire wolves than are gray wolves. But again, they're more genetically and phenotypically similar to gray wolves than they are to dire wolves. Hopefully you caught that distinction. And their mitochondrial genomes are almost certainly those of the domestic dogs that contributed the eggs. So they're transgenic organisms, like the glowing axolotls that we discussed in this video. And really, if you dig into what they've said, Colossal doesn't claim that they are anything more. But that ends up buried under sensational headlines. So that will likely come as a disappointment for many. But that doesn't mean that this isn't exciting for those of us that are excited about the concept of resurrecting extinct species. 
And even more so for those that are excited about the use of cloning technology to bolster the populations and genetic variation of extant species that are in danger of extinction in the future, while at the same time forcing us to grapple with a number of ethical questions that have, to this point, been more hypothetical than practical. Like, is it okay to bring species back from extinction? If so, under what circumstances? And what do we do with those animals that we resurrect? Are they destined for a future exclusively in captive settings, or do we attempt to reintroduce them into places with suitable habitat? Do we want dire wolves running around in North America today? These are big questions, not even all of the questions, and they aren't just academic anymore. And while these may not represent resurrected dire wolves, they do represent resurrected dire wolf genetics now functioning in living, breathing animals. The more we know about the genomes of extinct species, the more plausible it is that using the exact techniques employed here, we could actually produce organisms with genomes that are identical to the extinct species that we are attempting to resurrect. This isn't the end game, but it's a heck of a proof of concept. Not to mention the fact that Colossal is also using this technology to clone endangered species. I mean, heck, s suppose we have one male rhinoceros left of a subspecies that is otherwise extinct. Well, in the past, that would be the end of the story. But not if we use his DNA, or the DNA that we have of other individuals that are no longer with us, to produce a mate for him. Because in XY species, you can make females and males using genetic information in male DNA. A whole population could be generated. A variation could be added, and deleterious alleles could be eliminated. This is huge. And while we may not have the complete genome of a dire wolf to work with, there are other extinct species whose complete genomes we have at our disposal. We have nearly complete genomes for animals like mammoths and thylacines, and increasingly complete genomes for other animals like cave bears, quaggas, penguins, you, you know, real penguins, moas and stellar sea cows. And let's just face it, most of those species were driven to extinction by humans in the recent past. And the world would just be a better place if we had them back. Well, that is looking increasingly less hypothetical. And if you really want to get into an ethical quagmire, I mean, one of the biggest ethical dilemmas that you can get into as a geneticist, then we could always discuss the fact that two of the most complete genomes that we have for any extinct species are for Neanderthals and Denisovians. And right now, we are definitely at the point where our scientists should probably be more preoccupied with whether or not they should than they are with whether or not they could. Because the reality is that we almost certainly could, and if not now, very soon. But I can promise you that if a Neanderthal or a Denisovian walked by you as you were walking down the street in New York, that they wouldn't be the strangest person that you saw that day. So it's hard to say that it would be okay to keep them in a zoo. And if you clone them using Colossal's techniques, you would almost certainly use a sapien's genome as your starting point, and a sapien's egg as your donor, and a, a sapien's female as your surrogate. So could we? Yeah. If not now, very soon. But should we? That would be a very difficult case to make. How can we stand in the light of discovery and, and not act? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. As you may have expected, today's video has a pretty extensive Patreon extras video. It, it was really awesome because Will came in here having not heard this news. And Jason came in here having researched extensively this news, and they had very different feelings about this story, and we got to have a really, really awesome discussion. If you want to see that or the host of other features we have for our patrons on Patreon, please check it out. <clears throat> I don't know, it's just morning. A species of wolf-like canid that went to ex <laughs> Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll get there. Cool your jets. <laughs> Would be the banana. Let me say that how I have okay, it written. Before I do that, yeah. I got money that it was a chihuahua. It was a chihuahua <laughs> egg. Can you imagine? <laughs> and a, oh, and a, and a chihuahua mo surrogate mother, which is why they only birth one puppy at a time. <laughs> That's where my money's at. Yep. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs>